Welcome to the second Disability Rights Louisiana Lunch and Learn series. Um, and today's uh, session is on disability consciousness about how words and actions truly matter. To start off with, I want to just give everybody some ground rules and everything around the Zoom today. Um, if you are having trouble with any of the features or need to get our attention, please put them in the chat box. If you uh, communicate in a way other than typing and would like to uh, comment verbally, you can either use the raise hand or other icon to get our attention and we will unmute you. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, we would ask you to put them in the Q&A box and they can be anonymous there. And we will be answering all questions at the end of the session. And so let's get started. Before I go into uh, what Disability Rights Louisiana is, a, um, a visual description of me, I am a middle-aged white woman with very curly hair, glasses, and I am currently wearing um, yeah, headphones so that you can hear me. Um, and I am sitting in front of some bookcases with diplomas on them. Um, and my pronouns are she and her. So Disability Rights Louisiana. Disability Rights Louisiana is the protection and advocacy organization for the state of Louisiana. That means we have a federal mandate to protect, advocate, and empower people with disabilities all across Louisiana. And we do that not just through our legal advocacy, but also through policy and programs working with our community. And there is an organization like ours in every state and territory in the United States. Today, we're going to be focusing on interacting with people with disabilities. People with disabilities are everywhere in our communities. One out of every three to four Louisianans has a disability. And so as we're talking about this, this is not an issue in a vacuum. And what it, we really just want to bring to the table is the idea of being mindful when you talk and when you interact with people. Um, we do not have all the answers. Instead, we just wanna give you a starting place to think about these conversations going forward. And so um, I am Deborah Weinberg, I'm the Director of Community Advocacy here, and I am going to hand you over to Dr. Ashley Voyan, our policy analyst here at Disability Rights Louisiana. Hi everyone, thank you all for being with us today. I am the policy analyst at Disability Rights Louisiana. I am a Filipino white woman um, with shoulder length brown hair and I'm wearing a black sweater with a brown collar sitting in front of a white wall. And I am looking forward to talking to you about this subject today. So before we get started on talking about how to best communicate with persons with disabilities, we have to know um, what are some of the things that got ingrained in us or what are some of the stereotypes we hold in regards to disability. Because before we correct something, we have to know something is wrong. So oftentimes when we look at people with disabilities, um, a lot of times they'll be looked at as children or infants to lives. So, Oftentimes when I'm going around the community as a wheelchair user, people will be like, you're so cute, or, or say different little infantized things like that. 
Um, and also we get voted on as heroes for doing ordinary things. And a lot of times I like to tell people that the inspirational stories and narratives are nice, but would they be extraordinary if I was walking or moving around? Because anything that I'm doing right now is something that I love to do or that I like to do and not because I'm a hero. And then when we think about disability as well, we oftentimes limit their employment expectations. And again, that goes back to doing what you love to do or what you're passionate about just because a person has a disability. No matter what that disability is, if you really want to do it, or if it's your passion, you will make an alternative to do it. So we have to watch those narratives when you think about our stereotypes in regards to disability, because there shouldn't be any limitation to employment expectations. The question should be, how can we make this job to where this person can do it to the best of their ability? And kind of the flip side of that is sometimes we get the false narrative of people with disabilities when they do get those high power jobs are getting it, are succeeding because of charity, not because of their own merit. And that goes back to that same stereotype and those same, you know, kind of ingrained ideas that people with disability don't have what it takes to make it on their own. And so you, you, just being mindful when, when there is kind of that reaction that, no, if anything, folks are having to fight a lot of societal stigma and lack of accessibility to get to where they are. Um, I used to do a lot of special education law, and I know a lot of times I'd hear from folks, oh, he's that child is just using their mental health disability as an excuse for their bad behavior. That, yeah, that it's not that it's, it's really yeah, yeah, who, what they're dealing with, but instead it's really something that they're using to get out of trouble. And again, this kind of goes to something we're going to talk about later, which is a lot of times we as a society struggle seeing disabilities and acknowledging disabilities that are not apparent to the eye and so it, it, or that you can't see physically on a person. And because of that, with mental health stuff, a lot of times because people cannot see the challenges or your, the issues that are going on, that they automatically assume it's, that the behavior is intentioned. On the flip side of that, though, people, you know, there's this assumption, and it goes to what Ashley was saying, that, you know, these infantilized people are inherently good people. People with disabilities are people, and that means some of them are jerks, some of them are self-centered, some of them, you know, don't like the TV shows I like, and that's okay. Being truly equal means that people with disabilities have the same right to be bad people and make bad decisions as everyone else. So also going along with that, there's also the stereotype that smart and capable people don't have disabilities. And so um, I, I see that a lot with myself and that just because doctors will see me in a chair, sometimes they'll talk really slow to me. Um, like, I don't know what's going on and so a lot of times that stereotype comes into play when 
having to deal with really severe things like medical things and things like that. Um, and then going along with what Debbie just said, if you don't see the disability, it doesn't exist is one serious thing that people hold. Um, and also, I just want to bring up that not every disability is apparent to the naked eye, and that oftentimes I have a wheelchair accessible van, and sometimes I have to tell my friends or the people that I'm with because they'll be like, that person looks like they can walk, they shouldn't be in that space, but a lot of times with disabilities, um, especially with those associated with pain, you may not look like you have a disability, but you do, and it's just as valid as mine or others that you can see. Um, I like to call those uh, those friends of mine the parking police. Yes, <laughs> um, and then another stereotype that I always get is that all people with the same disabilities need the same thing. So oftentimes when people first meet me, they'll be like, oh, my friend has cerebral palsy. But I just want to bring to everyone's attention that even if two people have the same disability, their limitations or how their disability affects them can be two totally different things. I know people with cerebral palsy that are walkies, as they like to say in the disability community, and so they only have a limp, but I also have been exposed to other people that can't can speak or hold up their head and they have cerebral palsy too so we all have different levels of our disability and we all need different things and um you know just kind of rounding out the stereotypes out there is and i know that this is kind of funny coming from us as we're telling you what people might need. But the fact is, is that there is kind of this idea that peop the people without the disabilities know better what the person with the disability needs than the person needs themselves. And as has been kind of borne out in, you know, more situations I could count, Oftentimes, what the outside world thinks someone needs is very different from what's going to actually work for them. The person who knows their body best is the person who's been living in it. Um, but that said, that doesn't make every person with a disability a spokesperson or representative for all people with disabilities, because there is no one this is people with disabilities. We have a definition through the law, you know, as a lawyer, that's kind of always why I go to. But every person with a disability, like every person in the world has a different perspective. And so there is no one, you know, voice of the disability community. Um, and then I think this last one's really important to remember as you're thinking about the diversity of the community is there's kind of this idea that everybody who has a disability, if they could be cured in a moment, would choose that and that would be their choice for life. Not all people with disabilities need or even want to be quote unquote cured. For a lot of people, this is who they are. This is part of their identity. And part of respecting people is respecting the whole person, their needs and their desires. And a lot of times from the outside, there are a lot of people assuming that people may want that sort of uh, cure or fix. So, Kind of that's that's the stereotypes that we're kind of all working from as a society. And I know that's what a lot of what I was brought up with. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you too. And so 
we are not telling you what to do generally. These are our tips for just being respectful to people. Most of these apply not just to people with disabilities, but to all people. Um, because in showing that respect, you, it's much easier, whether it's in a friendship, whether it's in the grocery store, just to build a better community. So when speaking to a person, address the person you're speaking with directly. Um, so if the question refers to the person, don't ask their friend or their personal care attendant or their interpreter. Ask them because you want to think about it if someone had a question directed to you, but then ask your friend and you were sitting right there, how would that make you feel? That would make you feel like you weren't a person. So we want to be respectful of that. And again, the only person that knows what you need is you because you live in your body and your experience every day. So, this might be for some of us who are a little older. Uh, I remember in the 80s, especially 80s, 90s, when we were all starting to get on computers, we like to use all these funky uh, typefaces that were, you know, cursive or looked like they were written in chalk or, or artsy. But the problem with that is those aren't always accessible to folks, whether they have a reading disability like dyslexia or you have a, a disability related to vision. Generally, basic typefaces like Arial, Helvetica, Calibri, without busy backgrounds are generally easier for most people to read. And when it comes, so on this side, we have a keyboard and a pair of headphones on a blue background. But um, just to let you know, when it comes to communication, whether it be at work or just a friendly communication, you should always ask the person their preferred method of communication. Um, and it could be a wide range of things. Some people could like email or text messaging, while others want a written communication. Um, if read out loud, an interpreter, telephone, in person, video call, because we all have our own preferences and our own learning style. And Ash, I know for me, you know, even in, when I'm just meeting someone saying like, hey, would you prefer me to call you or text you about, yeah, about meeting up for coffee? Mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be a formal sit down conversation. You know, it's easy to work in. And that way you're also, you know, respecting the other person and maybe it's about their time or maybe they, you know, their phone has a really annoying beep when it when a text comes in, so they hate text messages. Who knows? But it, it, it's just another way to be respectful to everybody. Um, and I guess this one's mine here, which is a picture. So this slide here has a picture of kind of an outlined person with some hands on them. And basically, it's just kind of our way of saying, if you wouldn't feel comfortable touching someone and putting your hands on their body, act. don't put your hands on their wheelchair, their assistive device, or their service animal without permission, because it's basically an extension of who they are. You know, you're, someone's wheelchair or someone's um, cane, those are things that are incredibly crafted to the individual and are very personal and by doing that you're basically you know invading that person's personal space unless you have that relationship with them where you would otherwise do that 
And not only that, but if I can interject, yeah. um, I have a power chair. So if you try to control my chair in any way, you will run over your foot or run into something which can cause you a lot of pain or or destroy something, someone's property, or, you know, it might cause a really bad situation. So you really need to watch when you mess with someone's assistive device. And the same thing with service animals is that animal is working. So, you know, it's really tempting to go up and say, oh, that's such a cute dog. I want to play with him. Well, that dog may be working at the time. And that is something to keep in mind. And so unless the, per you know, unless you have permission from the person who is using that service animal, you don't bother them while they're at work. Mm -hmm. And this is just a general statement, but do not guess about what someone needs or wants. Ask them. Because I know this is just a minute example, but if you go to a restaurant, your waitress would not guess what you want to drink because they don't know. And that goes the same way for every situation. If you don't ask, you don't know. And you can't make assumptions. And it goes back to what you were talking about earlier, Ashley, that just because you know one person who uses a wheelchair wants the chair removed, for it, wants the dining chair at the restaurant m removed, doesn't mean everybody who uses a wheelchair wants that chair removed. Mm -hmm. Or just because one person wants a door opened for them doesn't mean that having a door opened for them actually might be a problem for someone else. So you're, yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and it's just also respectful to ask people what they want. Um, again, reiterating that people with disabilities know what they need. And part of respecting people is recognizing that they know that. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge thing whether we're talking about intellectual disabilities, learning related disabilities, mental health disabilities, pain related disabilities. The list goes on and on. There are a lot of disabilities that may not be apparent to the eye or when you see or interact with someone. And that is fine. There, people do not need to prove their disability to you. You know, people know what they need as accommodations in this world. And if you are able to just ask people what they need and ask everybody what they need, then you don't have to get into this, oh, do I need to accommodate them or not? Do I need to act differently? Just if you are open and let everybody tell you the best way to interact with them, then all of our relationships, not just on the level of disability, can be easier. So, um, Debbie found this amazing quote by Toni Morrison, really depicting why language matters. And it says, oppressive language does more than represent violence. It is violence does more than represent the limits of knowledge, it limits knowledge. And I believe there that the picture next to it is a picture of Toni Morrison. And that's from her Nobel lecture, I believe. Yes. So when we talk about disability, there's two primary ways that people can talk about disability, and that is person first language versus identity first language. When we use person first language, it puts the person before the disability, such as person with a disability. And this is preferred um, in legal settings or just when you don't know 
how a person identifies with their disability. But when we talk about identity first language, um, that's usually saying disabled person, and that's used by disability activists because that's taking the power back and showing pride in their disability. They don't mind their disability being associated with themselves and even myself in my writing or my everyday conversations, I'll go back and forth with saying person with a disability or disabled woman or, or things like that. I don't stick to one way of thinking. Um, but I like to tell people that if you're unsure about how a person wants to be identified with their disability and it's in a verbal conversation that you should just like we ask about people's pronouns now we should ask how do you identify with your disability so i i would like that to be common but in writing i would default to person first language because people won't um People won't chastise you for that. And it's better to err on the side of caution. Okay, so we we are not telling you what words to use and not to use because those are individual choices and they are different in different contexts and different peoples. But the way, and I think Ashley uh, brought this up from some of uh yeah some of the work that she lectures on as a professor is that things along the lines of green light words yellow light words and red light words that we're talking about you know, words that it you know range from those that are generally not going to cause problems those that are that you kind of should think before and those that might cause problems that doesn't necessarily mean use this word or don't but these are things to think about as you're choosing your language and trying to create a bond with whomever you're speaking with so i'm going to go through green light words first we have a nice little picture on this slide of a uh, traffic light with the green light lit up and so our green light words, which are almost always appropriate, we're talking wheelchair user. So yeah, that's someone who uses a wheelchair. Uh, disability, things like a, a impairment, apparent or non-apparent. That's when we were talking about whether you can see it or not see it. And then when we're talking about those parking spaces with, or the bathrooms with the little symbols on them or the blue parking spots, those are actually accessible parking spots or accessible bathrooms um, because they allow access. So now I'm going to talk about the yellow light words. And um, these are the words that we use with caution. And on this slide, we have um, a traffic light with the yellow light lit up. And so when we use the word handicap in describing the entrance, parking spot, or bathroom, et cetera, um, sometimes we won't use this, but use it with caution because older individuals may not be used to or accustomed to the word accessible so they may not know what you're talking about so you may have to use this word just for understanding purposes and then there's the word special and within the disability community the word special can be seen as condescending um and not like but there are things like special education um, that's still used in the terminology today. Um, so when we speak about things like special education, we can use this word, but be careful when using this word in an 
other contacts that are involved. And as a lawyer, you know, we talk about special needs trusts. Mm -hmm. We talk about special education. But remember that, but that's very different than saying, oh, Sally, Sally is special. Because that just, that is something that has been used to slight people and treat them like children, even when they're adults. Okay, and now we have our stoplight with the red light and our right light words. These are words that are almost always going to cause you problems. Maybe not always, but they're things that kind of stop people in their tracks a little bit. It's a lot of these can be words where if you're talking to someone with a disability and they hear you say the word, it's they're they're going to kind of focus on that. So um, I use the analogy, you know, I'm Jewish and, you know, I remember having a conversation with someone and they talked about Jewing someone down. They did not mean it badly. They did not know that was not an okay thing. But the problem was, is when I heard that, I stopped listening to the rest of the conversation because I was thinking about how to react to them using that word. And so it caused distance there. And so that's what a lot of these things will do. The disabled is the first one. And that's again just. People are people. Talking about a vast group of billions of people as one monolithic group or one all the same group is really kind of diminishing the beauty and quality in the diversity of people with disabilities. Um, we also have some words that just are, are words that have been used to keep people down, to keep people out of power, to keep people from being seen as valid members of society for a long time. And those are words like invalid, crippled, handicapped, retarded, the R word, um, crazy, insane, or mad. And those are all words we have, as a society, have used to tell people, your opinion doesn't matter. You are not one of us. And so cause, when you use those words, that is, someone, especially someone who has been called those things or had someone they care about call those things, they're going to have that same moment of you don't understand me and you don't understand what I or the people I care about have been through. Same thing kind of goes with things like wheelchair bound, bed bound, confined to. Those are terms that are about people being held back as opposed to being allowed access. Um, the same thing, if you could just go back, Kevin, one more second. The same thing goes with using um, victim of suffering from things like that. And then uh, same with the other antiquated terms here to call someone or something stupid. And then if also using disability as an adjective or a metaphor. A lot of times you'll hear people say things like, I'm so OCD about that, or I'm so ADD about that. And when you're saying those, you don't know what someone's experience is. And, you know, if you're saying, oh, I'm, I'm so ADD about that, I'm, I can't focus on more than one thing at a time. If the person you're talking to or someone they care about has, you know, had that been a really big thing in their life and a really big impact, you're diminishing what they went through, and again, putting that distance there. Since I know we're running a little late on time, um, what I was going to suggest is we do have some alternative words for people, um, alternative terminology, and this will be available 
uh, also uh, on the downloaded version of this. Um, and so if we want to go through uh, and skip over then, just go on. People can go back and do this. It's basically just giving some some fun terminology you can use instead. And, you know, and also just as we know with language, it is, you know, a lot of these disability terms people were using aren't very descriptive. They aren't giving people a good idea about what you actually mean. So there are lots of interesting words out there you can use to really describe what you want and what you need and how you think a person or situation is. So Ashley, should we correct people? <laughs> no, we should not. We should never correct someone who is discussing their own disability. Um, because there are terms out there that are used such as GIMP and CRIP that people take back for power that I cannot get with, that I do not like. But it's not my place to correct someone on their own choice of identifying. Um, and then how you correct a person depends on your relationship and context, right? So we're not telling you to get yourself fired or something. <laughs> you know, really think about your relationship and how you might approach that. Like, never correct someone when speaking about their own disability. And so if you're wondering, how do you start the conversation with a friend or someone else who, or a coworker who's using terminology or acting in ways you don't feel super comfortable with about this? These two videos are great. The first one is about, uh, the use of the word special. And the second one on here listed is actually a kind of a funny disability sensitivity training video. And all these are kind of lighthearted introductions to this sort of conversation if you want to have them. Okay, uh, I know we've run a little over time for some folks, but if anyone does have questions, please do feel free to um, put them in the Q&A box. And we just got, um, we just oh, got and it, it, since it's a special education question, do you want me to take this one? Yes. Okay. Uh, we got a question that says, in the education context, I recently heard the term exceptionality is used when referring to students with disabilities. What category would you put that term under? And so what I would say is exceptionality is for those of you who in Louisiana and in the education realm might know. Exceptionality is, is the term under Louisiana law for students who uh, get an IEP, and that is either for disability or for gifted, but typically for disability. Exceptionalities, I think, is fine so long as you're talking about it in the world it's from, which is the it, which is the school world and the education world. Um, I, I, you know, I personally wouldn't necessarily walk around saying she is exceptional unless I really thought someone was exceptional. And, but I think that's kind of, that's one of those that can be a little different. Okay. And I don't see any more questions in the box, but I did have one question, Ashley, that I'd love if you would answer, oh, which, yeah. which is, so what do we do when we make mistakes? 
because all this is new and not how a lot of us grew up. How would you suggest people handle it when they do use a term, they realize they've used a term incorrectly or it's pointed out to them? First of all, I just want to say just because you have a disability doesn't mean you don't make mistakes around language because I make them all the time. Um, but the first thing you should do when you do make a mistake is apologize for that mistake and then thank them for being honest with you and correcting you on that because Unless you're corrected, you'll keep on making the same mistake. And then tell them that you'll try harder to do better next time. But actually do try to do better. <laughs> Don't just say the words without any meaning by them. Actually work hard on doing these things. And when it comes to language, I still have to post those words on my wall and look at them every day because like Debbie said, I grew up in the 80s as well. So a lot of these red light terms that we speak of was common language in our vocab and my vocabulary growing up. So, you know, so we all have growing to do. Well, thank you everybody for taking time out on your Thursday uh, to spend with us. We will be having these events on the first Thursday of every month on different uh, disability related topics. For more information about our agency, please feel free to visit our website, which is all one word, disability rights LA dot org so that's d-i-s-a-b-i-l-i-t-y-r-i-g-h-t-s-l-a dot o-r-g or you can contact us at 1-800-960-7705 or fill out our intake form on our website um, you also can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash disability rights LA on twitter.com yeah, uh, dash uh, disability RTS LA on Instagram at disability rights LA and on LinkedIn as disability dash rights dash LA. And thank you again, and we look forward to working with you in the future. If, we, if you would like, we would really appreciate your completing a brief follow-up survey um, on SurveyMonkey. What we're going to do is also drop that into the chat box, uh, the URL for it, 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 because it's a whole bunch of letters. Yeah, thank you all so much. And have a nice day. And I also wanted to jump in as a host. Uh, thank you, Barbara and New Orleans Sign Language Services for your interpretation, for your providing ASL interpretation. Um, and please feel free uh, in the survey to let us know about any accessibility issues. Uh, we're working to improve every month issues with display and making sure everybody can see everything and read everything. Uh, if you have any other feedback on that, let us know so we can keep improving month by month. But thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks so much, Deborah and Ashley. Um, and thanks to all for joining us. Thank you. Later. And really depicting why language matters. And it says,